What's the goal of basketball? To win, right? But not just to win individual games. The ultimate goal is to win a championship. Of course, basketball is a team sport. Championships are won by the most complete, most inspired team. Every champion deserves credit. But the question on my mind is, who's the greatest team of all time? With apologies to Bill and Wilt, I have a list of eight teams since 1970 that I want to look at as having a claim to that distinction. It is a loaded question, and one that I ultimately can't answer. Is it the teams that were front runners from beginning to end? The ones who were unbeatable at their peak? Maybe the ones who tapped into something special and overcame countless obstacles? There is no right answer. It's your job to make your own call and it's my job to make the case. So today, I'll be making the case for the 1989 Detroit Pistons as the greatest basketball team of all time. You need people like me. You need people like me so you can point your fucking fingers and say, that's the bad guy. Bad boys, bad boys, what you gonna do? What you gonna do when they come for you? The Bad Boys. Perhaps the most notorious collection of bruisers and tough guys ever to play basketball. If you lived through it and you weren't from Detroit, odds are you hated the Pistons. Not just because they defined what a physical brand of defense looked like, but because they also kicked your team's ass at one point or another. They finished the regular season with a 63-19 record, lost only two playoff games, and boasted one of the vaunted defenses in basketball history. They ran nine or ten men deep, led by Isaiah Thomas and Joe Dumars in the backcourt, Bill Lambeer in the middle, Dennis Rodman, Adrian Dantley, and later Mark Aguirre as the forwards, Rick Mahorn at the four spot, and Vinnie Johnson, John Sally, and James Edwards coming in as reserves. Let's go ahead and get one thing straight. The Pistons are villains. What else would you call a team that threw more elbows, dealt more hip checks, and delivered more hard fouls than anyone? Watch any basketball documentary. Listen to any old interview. It's impossible to arrive at a different conclusion. Everyone hated them. Pippen, Jordan, Bird, McHale, Parrish, Worthy, reporters, announcers, commentators, executives, and fans alike pined for the heads of the Pistons. They were the villains. You might point out the fact that Bill Lambeer goes down as perhaps the most hated athlete who never did anything illegal. He bumped, shoved, pushed, and jawed against everyone, with special treatment saved for the league's most popular stars. Concerns were raised that his style of play wasn't just physical, it bordered on the intent to injure other players. You might remember the comments made by Rodman and co-signed by Isaiah after the 1987 Eastern Conference Finals against the Celtics, in which the two asserted that if Larry Bird were black, he'd be just another good player. But I'd have to agree with Rodman. If he was black, he'd be just another good guy. Add in the fact that Isaiah had the taste of sour grapes because of his infamous stolen inbounds pass in Game 5, and the Pistons looked downright petulant. Toss in the walkout after the 91 Eastern Conference Finals and a general air of intimidation and lack of sportsmanship from nearly the entire roster, and you could say that the reputation of the bad boy Detroit Pistons preceded them. That they were and have always been the villains. And you would be right. And that, my dear viewer, is exactly what the Pistons wanted. It's what makes them great villains, and what makes them a great basketball team. This team is layered. On the outside, you have the infamous physicality, the bully ball, the bad boy namesake. This fed into an entirely intentional and calculated strategy in which the Pistons sought to contest their opponents mentally. They wanted their opponents more preoccupied with where the next hit was coming from than with winning the basketball game. And you'll notice that through all the infamous scraps that the Pistons were ever involved in, they rarely threw the first punch. Agitate. Don't retaliate. Instigate. Don't initiate. None of it would have worked, nor been possible, 
had the Pistons not been ludicrously talented. And what brought it all together was the same thing that is at the heart of only the greatest of champions, only the most superlative teams, a deep, genuine, authentic bond and belief in each other. At the heart of the Pistons was the fact that they were a team. The physicality was what it was, and I don't condone what they did. At times it had an essence of brutality. Basketball is a better sport without it. But it did make possible an improbable championship run at a time when they weren't supposed to be there. It was an approach built almost out of necessity. The 80s belonged to Bird and Magic, and as Michael Jordan began his ascent, it was clear that he would soon inherit the league. No one allocated the time nor the space for a blue-collar team from Detroit without a single player averaging over 20 points to inject themselves into basketball history. Head coach Chuck Daly and Isaiah realized that this team couldn't win by playing the way the Celtics played. They couldn't win playing the way the Lakers played. They didn't have a Michael Jordan. They had to find an edge. And so they exploited the fact that at that time in the NBA, a foul was just a foul. You could get ejected for overtly malicious acts. You could get a technical foul for arguing a call or for technical infractions. But a clothesline was penalized the same way that a reach-in was. To gain an advantage, the Pistons became willing to go where no other team had gone before. They bucked sportsmanship, skipped over gamesmanship, and went to work on their opponent's psyche. Of course, none of this would have mattered. None of the mind games or the shit stirring would have done the Pistons a lick of good had they not been one of the deepest, most complete teams to ever compete in the NBA. Bill Lambeer, as we've established, was the league's premier antagonist. But his antics overshadow his tremendous defensive abilities, his exceptional rebounding instincts, his peerless durability, and the fact that he remains among the sweetest shooting centers ever. He averaged a 14 and 10 on 50% shooting, despite the fact that he didn't have a post move to speak of in an era that was still predicated on play down low. His quick trigger on a shooting stroke made Lambeer an essential pick and pop player, something that was nearly as alien in 1989 as a smartphone. Just as important, he never tried to be something that he wasn't. He knew he wasn't as good as Parrish or Kareem or McHale or Elijah Wan. He couldn't dream of competing athletically with the great centers at the time. So, he operated with intent, exploiting position, intelligence, tenacity, and physicality to command the court like a chessboard. He wore the black hat. He winked at the cameras when he knew that millions of fans were screaming at their TV sets. To the world, he provided a face for the bad boy image, a lightning rod for their controversy. To the team, he provided the spirit and the motor for everything they tried to do. Speaking of controversial guys with high motors, Dennis Rodman. Now keep in mind, this was not the Dennis Rodman with the hair and the tats and the high profile relationships. This version of Rodman was young, hungry, and motivated chiefly by his desire to prove that he belonged on a championship NBA roster. His rapid development necessitated a mid-season trade that we'll talk about later, but Rodman spent the majority of the year coming off the bench. Despite limited minutes, Rodman averaged nearly a double-double and was a first-team all-defensive selection. The most important thing to know about Rodman is that he cared. He cared a lot. He fought for rebounds, dove for loose balls, took defensive assignments personally, and paid no mind to speed limits. He was full throttle, foot on the gas, at all times. He cried when he won Defensive Player of the Year in 1990. He pumped his fist after taking every charge. Though he wasn't a scorer, young Rodman was an athlete on the level of Sean Kemp and Charles Barkley and belongs in the Chamberlain, Russell, Moses class of rebounder. At 6'7", he was the quintessential defender in the league. He could be stuck on anyone, from John Stockton to Scottie Pippen to Robert Parrish. No matchup was too big for him, and he consistently raised his level to that of his opponent throughout his career, whether it was Larry Bird or Shaquille O'Neal. As much as I've enjoyed and will continue to enjoy pushing the villain narrative with these Pistons, the fact is not everyone played rough. In fact, if you didn't know any better, would you believe me if I told you that the player for whom the NBA's annual sportsmanship trophy is named played for the 89 Pistons? It's true. 
Since 1996, the player who most exemplifies the ideals of sportsmanship on the court with ethical behavior, fair play, and integrity is awarded the Joe Dumars Trophy. Joe Dumars might not have shared the same attitude as some of the rest of the Pistons, but he was as vital to the team as any player, combining with Isaiah to form one of the scariest backcourts you can imagine. As a scorer, he was as well-rounded as anyone in the league. He wasn't a high flyer, but he could attack the basket, make his free throws, swing the ball around, and nail shots from all over the court. As a defender, I think I need only tell you that Michael Jordan cites Dumars as the toughest cover he ever faced in the NBA. Like Rodman, he was a first-team All-NBA defensive selection, perhaps even more impressive considering he didn't resort to cheap shots. Dumars goes down as one of the more nightmarish two-way matchups ever, capable of torching defenders like Michael Cooper and putting the clamps on even the likes of Michael Jordan. Averaging 27 points a game in the finals on a scorching 57% field goal percentage, Dumars' 1989 Finals MVP serves as a testament to the balance of the Pistons and to just how damn good he was. Rick Mahorn stood as a brick wall next to Lambeer, similarly unafraid to get his hands dirty, set hard screens, grab rebounds, and make his presence known. Vinny, the microwave Johnson, came off the bench to the tune of 14 points a game. As his namesake implies, the microwave could get hot in a hurry and feasted on opposing reserve units. John Sally and James Edwards were players more out of the Joe Dumars mold, in that they weren't complete assholes, but both men played key roles in the team's championship effort. Sally on the defensive end with his hellacious blocks, and Edwards on the offensive end with his unstoppable fadeaway. Leading the show with an incandescent smile that betrayed one of the most competitive minds in professional sports was Isaiah Thomas. Spend any amount of time researching Isaiah Thomas's basketball career and you will hear a number of things over and over. First and foremost, that he remains the best pure point guard of all time. That isn't to say he's the best point guard of all time, but when it comes to what you would want out of a traditional point guard, speed, quickness, vision, passing ability, inside scoring, defense, toughness, leadership, and a dependable jump shot, Isaiah checks the boxes as well as any player who has ever played the position. He's on the short list of being one of the only point guards who can say that they were the best player on a championship winning team, alongside Magic Johnson and Steph Curry. Isaiah's stock has always been something of debate, and most of that is his own fault. Of course, the reputation of the team and their ability to make enemies out of everyone did him no favors in the moment. No one wanted to talk about how great Isaiah was. They went to bed at night dreaming of Isaiah getting rocked by Hulk Hogan. Because he managed to piss off so many stars, when they came together and formed the Dream Team in the summer of 92, Isaiah was famously left out. He hasn't done himself any favors in his post-playing career, embarrassing himself as an executive and coach, and prolonging his feud with Michael Jordan by asserting that LeBron James is the greatest player ever. He will always lose the popularity contest. Even people who never saw him play hate him, because the legends of the game hate him. None of this is to make you pity Isaiah. When you choose to play like he did and cultivate a reputation that way, you have to live with consequences like this. But those aren't the only reasons Isaiah gets discounted. Isaiah could take over games at a moment's notice. He did it all the time, which is why his blunder in 87 is even more shocking. Isaiah lived for the big moments. But the thing that made him special was that he sought basketball of the highest order. He didn't want to have to take over games. He didn't care about making all NBA teams or winning MVPs. He wanted to win, and he wanted to win with a team of guys who bought into a culture of accountability and camaraderie. He gave up shots and minutes so that Dumars and Vinnie Johnson could develop. He cultivated the culture like a garden, meticulously tending to its needs, encouraging and ensuring that it grew in all the right ways. In his eyes, a team was a lot harder to stop when you had to worry about nine guys who could beat you than it was to stop two or three. It's why the team's statistics don't jump out at you. 
They played a style of basketball between the lines. The balance of the Pistons roster, their flexibility and versatility would not have been possible had Isaiah not been so willing to sacrifice his own success for the greater good. You might think that's hokey and you might think that's bullshit, but it's true. When you talk about that era of basketball, there are four names that matter more than all the others. Magic Johnson, Larry Bird, Michael Jordan, and Isaiah Thomas. And oh, by the way, Isaiah has a winning playoff record against each of those other three players. If you want proof of the Pistons culture, look no further than the Adrian Dantley trade. A 6'5 scoring machine that would one day end up in the Hall of Fame, Dantley arrived in Detroit in 87 and immediately made an impact. He gave the team an offensive dynamic that they'd been missing for years and helped propel the franchise to contender status. But by 89, Rodman's development was reaching a level that necessitated that he be on the court at the end of games instead of Dantley. Dantley, a 12-year NBA veteran, was unwilling to make room. So the team traded him for Mark Aguirre. The same Mark Aguirre who was only available on the trade market because he had worn out his welcome in Dallas after conflict with coaches and teammates. You might argue about who was the better individual player between Dantley and Aguirre, but Aguirre came to the Pistons with something to prove. It was made clear to him from day one by Lambeer and Isaiah that he was expected to buy in, to sacrifice for the good of the team, to do what Dantley couldn't. It worked. Aguirre went from averaging over 25 points a game over his last five full Dallas seasons to 15 a game as a Piston in 89. With his incendiary scoring abilities from the post and Rodman's defensive versatility on full display, the Pistons flourished. In the 50 games between Aguirre's first game and the Pistons hoisting the championship trophy, the Pistons went 44-6. and six. They swept Bird Celtics in the first round, swept the Bucks in the second round, fended off Jordan's Bulls in six, to set up a rematch with the Lakers in the finals and sauntered their way to a championship sweep against the defending champions. Now I'll be the first to point out that the Celtics were past their prime in dealing with injuries, that Byron Scott missed the finals because of a hamstring injury before game one, that Magic was himself hampered by a hamstring injury in game two. But the 89 Pistons aren't the greatest team of all time because of who they beat to win their first championship. They're the greatest team of all time because of how they won that championship. The Pistons were designed to beat those teams at their peaks. Just because the Pistons got lucky at the same time they were peaking takes nothing away from how good they were in my eyes. What do you want? Do you want a team that can defend in the post? Ask any big man from that period about what it was like to play against Lambeer, Mahorn, and Sally. Do you want to shut down scoring from the guards? Look no further than the greatest defensive backcourt ever in Isaiah and Dumars. And if there's any player that's too big for the guards and too quick for the big men, Dennis Rodman is waiting in the wings as one of the most devastating individual defenders that the game has ever seen. The scoring could come from anywhere. The synergy of the team was such that they would feed those hot hands and usually heat up themselves to crush you in a million different ways from every direction. The scoring disparity between their leading scorer and their ninth man was 11 points a game. That's the same scoring disparity between Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen in 1996. They passed brilliantly. They played without ego. They could shoot. They could score inside. They could penetrate. Ironically, the bad boys played a very unselfish style of basketball that were it not for the hostility of their attitude, would have had basketball purists singing their praises. This team had an identity as the villains. They embraced it. It brought them closer together. As the rest of the world got more hostile, the Pistons got closer. To a man, they all speak of each other, not as co-workers, but as friends and brothers in arms. Yeah, they were the bad guys, but give me a great villain over a decent hero every day of the week. They're so much more interesting the best heroes are the ones who have to overcome their flaws, and the best villains are usually the ones with something humanizing about them. Look at Isaiah's Game 6 in the 88 Finals, the year before this championship team. 
He was rolling in the third quarter, with his team up three games to two against the Lakers. He was doing everything in his power to launch his team over the finish line. And with his franchise's first championship just 20 minutes away, the unthinkable happened. Fast break situation, streaking down the court, he rolls his ankle. He hits the floor and reaches out, instinctively grasping at the referee as he tries to stomach the pain. His ankle is sprained, badly. On the bench, he clenches his teeth, summoning every bit of willpower he possesses. The Lakers take advantage and surge back to take the lead. And then, hobbled and limping, Isaiah returns to the game. What follows is one of the gutsiest performances in the history of championship competition. Three and a half remaining in this period. Thomas with a looper, scores. Thomas, off balance, basket fouls and a foul as he goes into the first row and he is still limping. Thomas goes for three and hits it. What a third quarter for Isaiah Thomas. Lakers now the Pistons with Rodman. Two on one, Thomas moves up. And Isaiah Thomas having an incredible period. He has 35 in the game, 23 in this period. And the Pistons have regained the lead, 23 points. And the shot again by Thomas. It is 81-79, the period is over. Can you imagine the great performance, maybe one of the best we've ever seen in one quarter in NBA Finals history? He finished the quarter with 25 points, the most ever in a single quarter of a Finals game. The game would end on a pair of Kareem free throws following a controversial foul call against Lambeer. Karma, some would say, for all the fouls he got away with in years prior. The Pistons would lose Game 7 as Isaiah watched most of the second half from the sidelines. In light of that effort and that heartbreak, how can you watch the Pistons celebrate in 89 and not feel, if only for a minute, that they deserved it? They didn't cheat. They didn't cheat the rules, they didn't cheat the game, and they didn't cheat themselves. They earned every bit of what they achieved. The 1989 Detroit Pistons were willing to do whatever it took, at whatever cost. Listen to the way Lambeer talks about their approach. He sounds like Sun Tzu. Break the spirit of their leader, and you'll break the spirit of their unit. You couldn't come up with something that the Pistons didn't already have an answer for. And there have been few teams since that can boast a deeper, more versatile roster. Their masterful play their inspired defense, their remarkable selflessness, and their ability to win games without scoring a layup make the bad boys the greatest basketball team of all time. They were willing to do whatever it took. And what it took was to become the villains.